All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'd like to thank everyone who's joining us today. Welcome to today's CNCF webinar, Ensuring Compliance Without Sacrificing Development Agility and Operational Independence in Kubernetes with OPA Gatekeeper. I'm Karen Chu, Community Program Manager at Microsoft and CNCF Ambassador. I'll be moderating today's webinar, and we'd like to welcome our presenters today. We have Sir Taj Erzurjan, Software Engineer at Microsoft, and Lock of Lockheed Evenson, Principal Program Manager at Microsoft. Um, just a few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you will not be able to talk as an attendee. There is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to drop in your questions there and we'll get through as many as we can at the end. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of the Code of Conduct. Basically, please be respectful to all of your fellow participants and presenters. Please also note that the recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF webinar page at cncf.io slash webinars. And with that, I will hand it over to Sir Taj and Lockie to kick off today's presentation. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Karen. Hello, everybody, and welcome. You are in for a real treat today. Today, we're talking about OPA Gatekeeper. And for those of you who've never heard of OPA or Gatekeeper, we're going to walk you through everything, everything you need to know about policy and governance for your Kubernetes cluster. So today, we're going to go on a journey telling you what OPA Gatekeeper does, sharing how you would use it, walking through a real world scenario from end to end, uh, in both personas, both admins and developers alike, uh, share some demos with you, and then tell you how you can connect, get connected into OPA Gatekeeper. Now, it's worth noting that OPA Gatekeeper is a sub-project of Open Policy. So when I say OPA, I'm speaking about Open Policy Agent, which is a CNCF project. And Gatekeeper is specifically about how we implement OPA into Kubernetes using uh, the Kubernetes API and CRD. So we're going to go through the whole thing, how you can create policy and how you can make sure that all your Kubernetes resources are in compliance to that policy. You can see the link there down the bottom on GitHub. So if you're interested in following along, everything we're going to be sharing today is available at that GitHub link. So we're excited uh, to get started here. First, next slide, Zertaj. First, we're going to share what Gatekeeper actually is under the hood. Um, Gatekeeper is, um, as it states there, a customizable Kubernetes admission webhook. So if you're not familiar with admission webhooks, you can actually create pieces of software and for each request that comes into the Kubernetes API, you can send them over to this webhook to make a decision to whether admit, to admit that request or deny that request. So we can actually create policy um, behind that, backed by OPA, and decide on whether we should admit or deny each request that comes into the Kubernetes API. And why would we want to do this? Uh, it's to enforce policies and strengthen governance. So we're going to dig into exactly what that means and how it affects you. Next slide. So really, we want to understand why people would be interested in using Gatekeeper and the problems it, it tries to solve. So if you've been using Kubernetes and operating Kubernetes, you've probably been looking at ways for end users to uh, actually have a great experience and control what end users can do. Whether they're creating any types of resources, you want a way to actually understand and create policy and say whether those resources can be created. For example, can you uh, label de uh, deployments a specific way? Can you create uh, specific objects with specific specifications in those objects? So at object creation time in the Kubernetes um, cluster, we can actually control what we would admit based on some criteria there that we can define. So we can create policy here to meet governance and legal requirements and also just to enforce best practices. For example, I've seen um, some policies out there to say, hey, you're using a deprecated Kubernetes API. You could send an, a message back to your user so that they uh, can be enticed to move to a stable API. That's just an example. We're gonna walk through some other examples of how you might actually use Gatekeeper. Uh, 
So let's get into a real world example here. Now, the way we're going to break this example down is we're going to do it in the perspective of two different personas in a fictitious company called Agile Bank. Uh, so of course, Agile Bank is building the greatest P2P money transfer ever uh, created. Uh, but more to the point is they're in a highly regulated industry. So they need to ensure that their cluster resources on a Kubernetes cluster are compliant with some uh, governance that they've defined for those resources. Now, I like the last point here, both admins and, develop and developers are unhappy. Let's see how we can use Gatekeeper to make both of those personas happy um, and how we can actually not get in the way of the great experience Kubernetes has. So first of all, I'm gonna be wearing the admin hat. I'm gonna pass it to Sertage to wear the developer hat, but let's take a look at the admin persona specifically. Uh, so I'm an admin, I can't keep up with infrastructure changes. Um, people need new resources, people want access to different types of things, you know, persistent volume, secrets, different backends, um, different networks, load balances, for example, uh, do I want to allow access to external load balances? So that's really hard for me to keep up with when the idea of Kubernetes is that an admin does not necessarily get in the way of the developers doing their jobs. So how can I actually create a system that allows uh, policy to be expressed without me and my team uh, needing to get in the way of that? So we're spending at the moment too much time on understanding whether things are compliant or not compliant. It's manual labor. I need to audit all the resources and look for anomalies uh, that don't meet compliance. Everybody keeps making the same mistakes. So we actually uh, need everything labeled a very specific way um, so that is compliant, but some development teams aren't labeling things the way that uh, we need them to. So can we take an action on that? And figuring out what resources belong to what groups is hard. Does this sound familiar? Can we actually solve this problem with Gatekeeper um, and make my life and our, my team's life much easier? Now we're gonna pass it over to the developer persona, Sertaj? Yeah, uh, I, I am the de developer here um, and um, I cannot make infrastructure changes. Um, I, like, I have the app, I am ready to go. I know exactly what I want. Um, I want to uh, de deploy and uh, t test my app. I want to deploy to production, but I don't have any permissions to do it because I need to uh, wait, wait for admin to uh, g give me access to, to, to the resources. Um, uh, so I, I need to, I, I keep waiting for admin to make these changes and sometimes it takes a long time. Uh, sometimes the turnaround is really, uh, is really long. So I just keep waiting uh, for, for these uh, changes to happen. Um, and then when I uh, do something, it's hard to know if that change is uh, conformant. Uh, sometimes these uh, conformancy changes. Uh, so it's really hard to keep track of what changes over time. Uh, while I just want to focus on the app, I want to focus on my code. I also I need, need to know about all these conformancy changes that happens at Agile Bank all the time. Uh, in th these changes are proposed, rejected, updated, uh, reproposed. So it's it's very hard to keep up with all, over time. Uh, and then turnaround time is uh, is at least a day. So it, it takes a long time for to to keep up um, with all the changes that happens. Okay, before we uh, go into the user requirements, I see some great questions that I would love to answer live. So I'm gonna take a moment, please keep the questions coming. We are here to answer those questions and thank you for asking them. First question is, will the demo code samples be made available afterwards? Uh, absolutely, so if you go to the gatekeeper repository on the first slide that we had there, which is open policy agent gatekeeper, there is a directory called demo. In that directory is a script where uh, we are going to run through the demo later in this uh, webinar and you can recreate it on your own afterwards. So um, you should be able to get access to the complete demo. So don't worry about typing or taking screenshots. Also, this will be recorded um, and we have recordings of the demos as well. So hopefully that answers your question. Thank you very much. Uh, um, so all, all the demos will be under demo agile bank and then there's a script called demo to the uh, So if you run it, you'll, you'll get the whole demo experience that they're going to show later. Thank you, Sertaj. Second, second question I'm going to take a stab at. At some point, it would be good to understand the difference between OPA Gatekeeper and Kiverno, which is a similar project. 
Unfortunately, I don't have uh, all the knowledge of Kiverno. I have heard of it, so I can't speak authoritatively on the differences. Sertaj, do you know? Uh, same for me, yeah. Uh, I only know like very high level. Yeah, so unfortunately we can't speak to it. Hopefully we will give you enough of the equation today to answer what Gatekeeper does and how it operates. Um, and then we can take a look at Kiverno. Thank you for asking that question. Uh, last question is, does OPA allow specific cluster role allowed or not to a cluster and by who? Is there a GitHub repository to give useful rules to be set inside a GitHub, uh, inside a Kubernetes cluster? So there are two parts to this question. I'm gonna answer the second part. We have links later in this uh, where we have policy libraries and example policies that you can apply to a Kubernetes cluster for the most common use cases. You are also free to write your own policies and PR them up as well. But we have covered many things uh, that we'll cover in this webinar. The first part um, of that question, um, do you, can you answer that, Sertaj? It, it is, does OPA allow specific cluster role allowed or not to a cluster and by who? Uh, so you, you, using Gatekeeper, you can uh, set, set up rules to be able to uh, allow certain things, um, it could be, like images, it could be uh, uh, labels, uh, it could be any, anything uh, you, you, you want basically uh, in, in, in those things. And we are gonna sh show some of the, the libraries uh, in this webinar. Uh, so you'll be able to uh, try those out and then see if those work for you or not. Uh, and then we also have uh, these uh, pod security policy equivalent uh, sort of um, uh, uh, policies that you can try out and then uh, uh, see if they work for your use case. Uh, if not, you can always uh, add on to it uh, or develop your own. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for those questions. Feel free to keep them coming. And as we see them come in, we'll take a moment to have them answered. Back to user requirements. Thanks, Sertaj. Okay. Oops. Slow down, slow down. Yeah. Okay, there we are. <laughs> Okay, so we're at user requirements. So remember we're going through the requirements of Agile Bank from the perspective of the admin and the developer. So now what we're gonna do is just codify exactly what those requirements are. So we wanna free up admins time, allow them to have audit and enforcement and have that automated for them. Make sure they have common best practices. So we just had a question about what are common best practices. We'll show you how to enforce common best practices for Kubernetes clusters. And all resources have a key, a clear owner. So that's just for our, ad, our um, administrative team, our operational team to understand who owns what resources. Um, and from the developer side, we wanna unblock developers. So admins are no longer standing in the way uh, uh, of all the changes they need to make to their specific application. So self-service is no longer a risk to conformance um, and fail fast means that developers, we can actually implement ways to give developers instant feedback. Okay, so from here, let's take a look at some specific governance policies that we're going to create. So here are some policies that um, Agile Bank would like us to create. All namespaces must have a label that points to a portal uh, point of contact. All pods must have an upper bound for resource usage. Everybody knows having no resource usage on your pods can cause all kinds of fun. Uh, this is a great way to actually make sure that everything has a resource limit. All images must be from an approved repository. So your container repository, you have an internal corporate uh, container repository. How do you make sure that everything deployed to this Kubernetes cluster only comes from that repository? Super important, I hear that one very often. Services must have globally unique selectors. Have you ever typoed uh, a label selector on your service and actually pointed to the wrong service on the back end? Also very common, I know I've done it. Um, so I would love to have a way to make sure that label selectors are globally unique and ensure all ingress host names are uh, unique. This is also a fun one. If you reuse um, ingress host names unbeknownst to somebody else in some other namespace, you can have weird and wonderful effects on your ingress controller. So you can actually enforce that out of the gate and make sure that all your ingresses are globally unique. Okay. So we're gonna dive into it now and get straight into um, constraints and constraint properties here. I will flick it to Sertaj. Yeah, um, so it, it, we wanna de de uh, define constraint properties as uh, things we wanna end together. 
Um, so in, in this sense um, that we want to express intent by ending them together, uh, we only make the cluster uh, more uh, constrained and then removing can only re loosen these constraints. Uh, so by th th there should be no uh, weird interaction between adding one constraint that happens some, some, that something happens over there. Uh, we only want to make it more constrained by adding more uh, constraints and then removing can only loosen them. And then if, uh, since these are all ended together, uh, one rejection should uh, uh, end up being the whole uh, re request being rejected. Uh, so in, in this way, we, we can keep track of like, hey, we just want to end these together. And then if any of them is not uh, true, uh, then we request, uh, re then we uh, uh, reject the request. And then uh, we also want to uh, define a schema where uh, we can write constraints uh, that gives the intent of like, hey, this is the um, this is the name that we want, or this is the the regex that we, that we are looking for. Uh, in this way, we're, it's going to be less error prone. Um, in this slide, uh, we are going to see an example uh, of a constraint. Uh, so this this one is um, if, is of API type uh, constraints gatekeeper .sh. Uh, and then uh, it is uh, of kind uh, case required label. So this is the agile banks, um, all namespaces must have an owner um, use case. Uh, so in this case, uh, we are just looking for the namespaces uh, uh, kinds. Um, since namespaces are in the core uh, API group, we just leave that one empty. Um, and then if you want a deployment, for example, uh, it would be in like the apps API group. Or if you have, if you're watching any, if you want to match any, anything, any other resources that you would just uh, define as part of the, the kinds here. Um, and then uh, this is the, um, uh, the um, parameters that, that we see. Uh, so th th these are the in in intents. Um, so the, the, the me message is, uh, is a nicer message that user uh, gets when uh, their uh, request is rejected. So all namespaces must have an owner label that points to your company username. So this way uh, you uh, failed, but at the same time you, you, you get a message that's saying why you failed. Um, so this is like a nicer way of knowing like, hey, I need to do these actions. And then here is the, uh, for the Agile Banks use case, here is the allowed regex that uh, users can add uh, their usernames or whatever. So if you're, uh, you, you will put your name there dot Agile Bank dot demo in this case uh, for the accepted username. So this way, when somebody looks at the uh, namespace, uh, they would know, hey, uh, this person uh, from this, uh, uh, this department created this um, namespace. So th this way we can track um, of who created what over time. So Tash, uh, can mm -hmm. you just go back a second? I'd like to ask you a few questions. Yep. Is that okay? Yeah, of course. So when we think about constraints, this is a new word to me. How should I understand constraints? Is it yeah, they essentially a policy or? Um, so co constraints are, um, it's basically, um, so we, we are going to, in, in later, we are going to see constraint templates. So in, in constraint templates, you define the logic of what happens um, of like, the, is, is the rego uh, code that um, uh, executes when you want to, um, when you want to run some of the, the, the policy engine. So and then constraints okay. are basically uh, constraints uh, give some of the parameters uh, to those um, uh, to those templates. So if you okay. want to have uh, certain uh, restrictions, uh, and it, like I mentioned before, they are ended together. Uh, so if you want to keep adding more stuff, uh, so you would do so with uh, with constraints. Uh, for example, you would be able to uh, say, "Hey, I only want uh, this uh, regex to be allowed." Uh, for allowed images, for example. So you can only uh, pull from my company's private um, uh, pr private registry for all images, or uh, you can only pull from this other registry also that uh, I am using for something else. Okay, so I see that this is uh, of kind uh, Kubernetes required labels. So yeah. I would expect to see a constraint template, which is a CRD for uh, called uh, Kubernetes that's, that's required right. labels. Okay, understand. And those parameters would be inputs into the schema or into that. Yep, that's right. Okay, we're going to see the right. templates at the end also. Uh, so this, that, this is basically how you uh, give, um, give parameters to, to that um, template. So if you want your message okay, to Okay, excellent. Do you? This is how you do it, do it. Excellent. Uh, 
Okay, thank you. Do we have a moment to pass a couple of questions? So oh, sure. I, I will read the, the first question. Is Gatekeeper a validation webhook? Can it also be a mutation webhook to satisfy constraints that are uh, not? So Gatekeeper is a validating webhook. Um, we, we don't uh, support uh, mutating uh, webhooks right now, but that, that's something we're discussing also. Okay, so mutation is, is on the roadmap. Second question, it seems that it has been some months since I heard OPA GK will be made GA. Are we in the same status? If yes, what are the main blockers to go GA? Uh, so uh, we are all on the road to GA. Uh, we have a defined uh, list of things that we want to accomplish. Uh, and we, we are getting there. Um, I think, uh, so, uh, so basically, um, you, in our issues list, if you uh, go and then look for the labels blocking GA, you'll see exactly uh, what needs to be done. Um, so for GA, we want to define HA, um, like high availability, uh, but so ju just in case, um, so we, we want to have the, at least like the, the definition of high availability. Um, and then um, so, some other items that if, if you go to the issues, you, you, you'll see um, what needs to be done. Uh, so it's one example is, for example, cache warming. Um, so for example, when, um, when, when Gatekeeper starts, it, it, it should look at the existing uh, constraints and constraint templates in the system, and then uh, it put, put, put those into um, uh, Gatekeeper uh, in, in, in OPA to, and then start serving um, after. Uh, these are all processed uh, and then have the ready check after all, 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 all of these uh, are processed. Okay, um, two more questions. Do you think that um, OPA, that with OPA, we can manage to obtain a multi-tenancy Kubernetes cl secure cluster? Mm. I, would, I would have a, t t I, I think this can be used as a piece of the puzzle. Security has many layers. Um, this can be one of them to enforce how resources are created and how they're an, uh, allowed access. Um, so it would be one piece. I wouldn't go as far to say that if you implement this, you would have a multi-tenant secure Kubernetes cluster um, only because multiple layers, even down to container runtimes, authorization, there are many pieces to that puzzle. But this is, can be used to complement your uh, security model in Kubernetes. Um, this one, I think I can answer, but I'll read it out um, for Sertage. If OPA Gatekeeper is down, does it block active uh, deployments? Does it run in HA mode? So as Sertage was saying, the definition of HA is one of the blockers to get um, V3 to GA. So at the moment, it depends on how you configure your validating webhook configuration. You can either have it um, fail open or fail closed, meaning that if Gatekeeper is down, will you allow the request or will you block it? And that is um, part of your validating webhook configuration on the Kubernetes cluster. So you can do it in both ways, but obviously we want it to always run, which is why we would like to have a HA option. Yeah, so currently we are failing open, uh, which means if, if the Gatekeeper is down, it is going to allow uh, requests, uh, but we want to get to fail closed. So that's the, the ultimate end goal. Um, but for, for that to happen, we, we need HA. Um, yeah. Thanks, Sertaj. Uh, please continue. Uh, so and then the, 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 the next topic is basically audit. Um, so audit, uh, or do we want to look at the uh, re resources in the cl last cluster and then periodically uh, evaluate if uh, the, how, how these are uh, doing against constraints, uh, if these are in violation or if they are, uh, if, if, if they are uh, in compliance. Um, so and then this one uh, is good so uh, developers or admins uh, can look at the cluster states and then the compliancy uh, of the resources uh, that are running in the cluster um, a, as it happens basically. Uh, and then you can always take uh, action uh, against these audit results. Um, so uh, these audits are exposed via the status field of the constraint we're gonna see in the next slide. Uh, so basically this is like a really uh, n nice way to just look at the state of the cluster. Um, and then uh, a, a recent change in, in the gatekeeper is uh, we are now allowing um, the gatekeeper audit as a separate uh, deployment. Uh, so um, for you don't have to have the validating 
webhook deployed to run audit. Uh, so this, this is like a very, uh, like uh, as for use case, because some people just, they, they, they just want to start with audit and then see like what are compliant without actually uh, deploying the webhook and then uh, seeing rejections. So this is like a really good way to see uh, like what are the, uh, the, um, uh, the, the stuff that is incompliant or not compliant in your cluster. Um, so this is the, basically the, uh, the constraint we just uh, deployed uh, earlier, that we just uh, saw it earlier. Um, so in the, um, uh, in the status field, like I mentioned, uh, you'll, you'll see the audit timestamp. Uh, so this is the, the last time that audit happened. And then under violations, you'll see um, the, what uh, like namespaces uh, are, uh, are in violation of this rule. Uh, so in this case, we have default gatekeeper system, cube public, cube system. Um, and then because of uh, re, uh, like re, re resource constraints in, in the cluster, we are um, keeping these violations uh, limited. Uh, by default, I believe it's 20, but you can always increase it. Uh, so uh, since these are limited, we also added a total violations field. Um, so th these will be truncated at some point, uh, unless you change that setting. Uh, and then the to total violations will always list uh, whatever um, violations you have uh, while the, the, the violations list is um, truncated. Any questions about this one? No, keep going. Keep going, okay, cool. Um, yeah, like I, like I mentioned earlier, um, we want to uh, test these uh, without enforcing them. And then this is where the dry run comes in. Um, so just, uh, uh, just like uh, audit, uh, I mean, this is part of audit, uh, you'll, you'll see the, uh, um, the, the violations in the status, but in this case, they are not actually enforced, but they are only seen in the cluster as violations. Um, so similarly, um, if you add a, a enforcement action dry run, um, you'll get into the dry run mode for, for that constraint. Uh, by default, enforcement action is deny. Um, so if you didn't specify enforcement action, that would be deny. Uh, if you did specify it deny, that would be the default behavior, or you could uh, specify dry run. Um, so in this case, um, the, the, the violations you see are um, uh, for, for dry run. So they, they, they're uh, visible in the audit results, but they're not enforced. Uh, uh, with, with the webhook. Yeah, I just want everybody to take a moment to understand audit and dry run specifically. So I think the use case here is I have a cluster with a lot of resources and I want to bring that cluster into compliance. So I haven't installed a brand new cluster or created a brand new cluster and put Gatekeeper on it. I have a lot of resources. I want to bring them into compliance. So with dry run and audit, it allows you to actually get visibility and pass through that loop of all your policies and see what's out of compliance and then take action to fix things. And you would eventually have this status field empty once everything is in compliance. So now I wanna pass that answer back through a question we have here. Is it possible to crash or block your Kubernetes cluster if you have a bad rule? It is absolutely possible to do that, which is why we create a dry run and audit to allow you to actually say, I wanna test this policy and see if it's catching the things that I want it to catch and then clean them up without having the risk of actually blocking admission to the cluster. So that's one, um, one question. Uh, keep going, Sertash. Um, and then uh, one of the other um, Agile Banks' scenarios is we wanna um, uh, enforce global unique ingress host names. Uh, for the handling uniqueness, this is an interesting use case because uh, we uh, want to de define some constraints that compare things to e each other and then to make sure that they are unique. Um, and then some of these constraints are uh, impossible to write without access to, um, to, to a state more than just the object under test So because we, we want to see the other objects uh, in, in, in the cluster. Um, and then by default, um, audit um, will request uh, each resource uh, from the Kubernetes API server. So it uses the discovery client uh, to, to, to check with the Kubernetes API server uh, in each cycle of the audit. Uh, but, uh, and then we have a, uh, a flag called audit from, from cache uh, equals true. Uh, so if you set this uh, flag, uh, the source of truth uh, will be the OPA cache. Uh, so, uh, so OPA uh, uh, will, will have, have the, the, the cache. Um, so, and it's defined by this config object on the right you'll see here. 
Um, so it'll basically cache uh, things like, in this case, service, pod, namespace. Uh, you could have like ingress or service, I mean, service, sorry, here. Uh, in, in ingress, for example, here, whatever uh, uh, things you want. Uh, so in, if you wanna uh, compare uh, ob objects against each other, things like this uniqueness case, uh, you, you would need uh, data replication and uh, the, the config object. But by, but by default, uh, it, it'll use the, the Kubernetes API server, so you would not need this uh, unless you are um, handling uniqueness cases. And then uh, we talked about constraint templates earlier. Um, so Rego is the um, is the, um, the the language for OPA, uh, and then this 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 the constraint templates con uh, contains the uh, Rego role signature. Uh, so it basically contains all the, the logic of what happens uh, when uh, the uh, gatekeeper executes uh, the, these constraints. Uh, and then if, if the rule matches, the constraint is violated. Uh, and then we also uh, talked about the schema for the constraints. And then this is where the, the schema is defined. Um, this is a little small, but hopefully you can uh, see this one. Um, so this is this for the same example for the uh, case required labels you'll see the, uh, the schema uh, defined here. And then this is the exact one we looked at earlier. So this is uh, where you define your schema while the constraint uh, uh, contains your parameters. So in this case, we are de uh, defining things like the, uh, the message, which is of type string, or allowed regex, which is also of type string. So in this, this is the, the schema of the constraint. And then under the targets in the, in the rego, this is where the, the rego, um, uh, like the, the logic code. So if this, this, this matches, then you get the deny message basically. And then we also saw like the, the, the message earlier, this is the, that's the, the message that, that you would re get, uh, get returned. So if this executes uh, and if, if it's true, and you, you, you get that, uh, um, you, you, you get a deny basically. Uh, so and then this is where you would define your different logic. Uh, and then we're gonna see on the library, uh, you can take a look at it. Uh, we have some of the uh, like more co common use cases. And then so you can always get started with those things. So you don't have to uh, come up with all these yourself, but uh, in the library, we have uh, most of the common use cases. And then you can also define uh, things like helper libraries um, or any, anything uh, in here also. Um, so yeah, we want to uh, talk about uh, metrics also. Uh, so one of the later ed uh, additions to a gatekeeper is the inclusion of metrics. Um, so uh, currently we are supp uh, supporting Prometheus as a uh, backend for metrics. Uh, so we are um, uh, we have metrics for things like violations per enforcement action, um, and then this is the one you see here. So you would see like how how many. Oops, um, how many uh, denies have you seen, like, or how many dry runs of these uh, violations? Uh, so you could track over time what happens in your cluster. Um, and we are gonna see a demo of this also uh, in a little bit. Uh, total number of constraint templates and constraints. Uh, the, when was the last audit? Uh, how, how long did the audit take? And there, there's a lot more uh, metrics in this case. Um, any questions uh, so far? Uh, Continue, we'll take questions in a moment. Okay. So I think one of, the, one of the biggest values that Gatekeeper brings to OPA is allows for code reuse. So if you've worked with Open Policy Agent, building your own rego policies to actually do the thing that you intend to do can be complex and you need to understand it. But one of the things Gatekeeper brings is a structured schematized version of that via constraint templates and constraints using Kubernetes so that you can actually share these things around, put them in your CI CD pipelines, test them, uh, make assertions on the schema, the types. So you can actually build some really good safeguards using Kubernetes APIs around what you're putting into that rego, which is the native language policy language of OPA. So the good thing about constraints and constraint templates and gatekeeper is we can build policy libraries and share them and bring your own parameters, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, so what I'm going to do is take a moment to answer a few questions here and then we're going to move into a time of demos. Um, 
So the, a, a couple of questions, and this is one that's probably interest to you. Interesting that the violations are kept in the custom resource for the rule. How about generating events for the concerned resources so that it also shows up on the violating resources? Does this make sense, Sertaz? So I'm, I'm guessing that you would annotate in the status field of a deployment if it was in violation is what the question is. Yeah, so we, right, right now we have it in, un, under the status field uh, of, the, 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 of the constraint. Um, I think the question was about events. Uh, we, we don't have, uh, I don't believe we have events. Um, but yeah, so they, they're are currently under, this, under the status. I think that's interesting. At the moment, we wanted to coalesce them into one place around the policy, so you didn't have to go and look in many places. Yeah. Um, but that's, that's an interesting thing. Feel free to raise an issue if you want to. Um, yeah discuss that further. Uh, I think there's one more related. The, the violations can either be viewed in the constraint status or sent to logs. Is there an alerting integrations, i.e. send the violations to Slack or how can we implement with any community tool? So do we have an eventing system? You just said no. Oh, uh, so uh, you, you can always de define these through metrics. Uh, for example, if you could set up uh, Prometheus to uh, set up alerts to uh, wh whatever platform you want, but be it Slack. Okay, so alert manager via the metrics in Prometheus. Yep. Is what you can do today. Um, how much performance impact can I expect? What if I have hundreds or thousands of policies? Yeah, it's, it's really hard to say like, hey, this is the, 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 this much is what, what you can expect, but uh, the, the more um, uh, constraints you have, the, the more uh, constraint templates you have, uh, and then also uh, depending on the audit limit, um, the, 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 the more uh, the performance impacts you see. Um, and then you should definitely test for your use case. Um, it, it's really hard to say, hey, this, this, this is the value. Um, we have done okay. some load testing in the past and then th these are also published. Uh, so you, you, you can take a look at it. Uh, I can also uh, put, put that link somewhere. These are great questions, keep them coming. In the same vein, how scalable is the cache if I have a thousand plus services, a thousand plus ingresses in this in the cluster to keep them for unique names? Will this be a problem for OPA? Yeah, it, it definitely, the more resources you have, the more uh, like memory it, it takes uh, if you are using uh, the OPA cache. Um, so yeah, I mean, th th that's definitely a concern if you have a lot of stuff. Uh, and then we are talking about like, I mean, like, uh, like tens of thousands or something like that. That's just like, uh, it, it, it becomes a, a lot of memory. Um, uh, yeah, we're trying to build some benchmarks, right? So for guidance about how much memory. And so we're working on that. That is uh, something that they're interested in building. So right. the short answer is we don't know. The long answer is we're going to test. Yeah, we, we have um, some. So I, I I did some load testing before. Uh, I can I can share the results. Um, okay, can you? Uh, while there's a few more questions here, go to the next slide, please, Sir Taj. So we have some demos. They're going. To, they're pre-recorded. We're going to walk through them now. Can you just pull up the first demo, and I'm going to quickly answer just a few more questions, Sir Taj. Uh, first one is, is there any existing repository hub for constraint templates that has rego generic policies? Yes. Um, we have a link in the deck a little bit later. So we will sh uh, you'll see that, but there are some policies um, already there to go. Um, can metrics be sent to anything other than Prometheus like Datadog? Not currently. Only yeah. through Prometheus. And then maybe you could use Alert Manager to fire something to Datadog. Yeah, uh, in, our, in our roadmap, we also want to uh, uh, implement op open census agent. Uh, so uh, you can specify whatever, uh, like a back, back, what back end. Uh, yeah, so that, that's definitely uh, an issue we have. Um, so if you like to contribute, that would be like amazing. Um, in the future, uh, Gatekeeper could evaluate service to service policies. I think absolutely there's a flexibility in OPA to be able to do that. You could absolutely do that on custom resources. Let's say you're running a service mesh, you could send them over and do validation, absolutely. Um, how is ConfTest different from OPA GK? So I will have a stab at this and let me know so it tells you if I miss anything. ConfTest uh, tests rego policies. So uh, 
raw rego policies, there was some talk to implement um, it to make it understand constraint templates and constraints. So um, OPAGK is using and leveraging the Kubernetes APIs and custom resources and custom resource definitions to schematize your policy and parameterize the rego. Um, whereas CompTest is just taking raw rego and then passing it through a set of resources. So either will have the same effect. I would say the way to think about OPAGK is a, a Kubernetes native implementation, leveraging the Kubernetes APIs um, to make uh, policy authoring and sharing a little bit easier. Anything you want to add, Sotaj? No, that's, that's about Okay, and one more. Is the deployment model always to co-locate OPA, gatekeeper in the same cluster as being controlled? Please describe more about the target model, including HA remote deployment, one to many clusters. Um, I don't. I don't believe uh, I've tested with different clusters, but uh, as long as, um, like, if if there's like a validating webhook that can target, should work. Uh, but I, it's not something that I've tested before. Um, yeah, it's certainly doable. I would just caution, obviously, your failure. Uh, failure scenarios when you uh, use a webhook that points off cluster or to another cluster. Obviously, you need to really understand the paths there um, to understand how it's going to operate if it fails. But we've been co-locating it and testing with co-location currently. Right. Okay, so thank you for all those questions. Uh, this first demo, we're actually going to step through those policies that we created for Agile Bank and show you how they look for not only an admin, but for a developer. So kick it off. This uh, great demo. Yeah. There, there, I was just going to say there's nothing uh, magic behind the scenes. Uh, so right now we're just creating a kind cluster. Um, so if, for those that, uh, that are not familiar with kind, it stands for Kubernetes and Docker. So it basically creates like a local Kubernetes cluster in, 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 in your machine. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So you can install Gatekeeper on any Kubernetes cluster, right? Right. Whether that's local using Kind or whether that's a cloud provider or something that you are running on prem. Okay, so we're just going to get pods. I think we're going to run through the install right now of Gatekeeper and and get it onto the cluster. Okay, so we're just applying the Gatekeeper set of manifests, which creates and sets up Gatekeeper and installs it on this cluster. So we can see that that has happened. Grab the, the cluster information here so that we can test it. There we go. So we can see now that in the Gateskeeper system namespace, we have a pod called Gatekeeper Controller Manager. So now we're the developer. Go ahead. So I'm the developer. I'm creating this um, uh, advanced transaction system namespace, kubectl create ns. Just uh, right ahead. Um, and then, um, uh, so five weeks go by, I moved to another different project, and then everybody forgets about the advanced transaction system. And then, Lucky? Yes, so I want to understand as an admin here, um, who created this namespace and how can I trace it back to the person that created or the team that created it? Okay, so before I delete it, I have, I can go and create a policy to make sure that I make sure that this never happens again. So here we have some constraint templates that I've just applied to the cluster. The interesting one is uh, required labels for this specific demo. Okay, we're going to have a look at those constraints and we're going to apply the constraints which provide the parameters to those constraint templates. And as we can see here that all must have, all namespaces must have an owner and that which means that there must be a key owner with a value that meets that regex for it to be allowed. Okay, so we've applied those constraints back to the developer. And then now I'm going to try to create a, a production namespace because I can, because I'm a developer. Oh wait, I got a, a error from server. Um, so it's all, all namespaces must have an owner label, uh, but I don't have it because I just created, I tried to create the 
in space production directly in kubectl 8 um, And here's what a good resource looks like. So and I'm including this uh, owner label uh, into my uh, production in space. Oh wait, it created, that's nice. Um, so now anybody can identify it. And then I want to deploy some pods uh, would, uh, that I define no limits. Uh, and then I get another um, um, uh, error from server saying like that my, um, um, my pod doesn't have uh, specify any resource limits. So I maybe I should specify some resource limits uh, so Kubernetes would know how to take care of. Um, so maybe I specify too high. That's not good, right? Because it's going to take a lot of memory uh, and then a lot of the, um, the space. And then I, uh, um, I, I deploy from my, my personal repo, for example. Uh, that's not allowed because I, I, I should be using the company's allowed um, the private registry, for example. And then here, then I'm, I want to, I, I, ch I change it to allow repos to open policy agent in this case. And then like, as you can see, uh, the error messages are like in, in, in instructable, I mean, like actionable. Uh, so you can take action immediately based on the, um, uh, the error. So, and then when I deployed the, uh, the OPA one, it, uh, uh, it, it proceeded as is because it, that was allowed. Um, and then here is uh, a, a um, duplicate service. So I deployed my service. Um, and then all is well with the world until the, this is getting cut off. And then that's, and then uh, until the big, big outage happens. And then Lucky. Right, so now we're looking through the audit use case. How do I actually look at resources that already exist that are non-compliant with that policy? So we're gonna go check the audits because we have some pods without resource limits. How do we actually look at that? Of course, we take a look at the Kate's container limits custom resource, and we can go and take a look at specific in the status section, we can see the pods that don't have any limits. So um, you can see down here in status, we have a bunch of uh, pods that do not have resource limits. So then I can take it upon myself to go and action them and apply resource limits. Again, super simple, I've defined the policy and then I'm leveraging audit to go and uh, remediate. Okay, so we've rolled out this new policy to production. I can now guarantee that everything is in um, compliance. We also wanna make sure that all ingress names are unique. So this is a common one that causes a lot of failures. Um, now we're taking a look at introducing new policies can be dangerous. We had a question about this earlier. How do we gain, pol how do we gain confidence that a policy that we've defined is actually doing what we need and doesn't break uh, our Kubernetes cluster or bring down the entire stack? So here we can actually create um, a constraint in dry run mode so that it doesn't enforce and we can see that if there are any conflicting ingress host names. Okay. All right, so we're going to apply that dry run template and then we can obviously use audit. In this case, we're looking at the dry run uh, uh, template. A con constraint template. And this is, uh, it uses the cache to confirm if any thing names overlap. Right, and there's the constraint. We get ingresses, we have two ingresses um, with the same host name you can see there. And now if we get the constraint, we should be able to see. So there we can see that we do have some, that conflict. I'm gonna create a, a third ingress to show that dry run does indeed not block any creates with the same host name. Yeah, since, since we are doing this in dry run mode, it does not uh, block. Block, yes. So as you can see there, here is another ingress host two with the same host name as the other. And that's 
being allowed, it should show up in the order to say that we indeed have a, that example. Okay, so soup to nuts, that is the, the whole flow from admin to developer. Uh, Sertaj is also going to show you what the metrics look like. Sertaj, which is the second demo, go ahead. Yep, this is the, the second demo for the metrics. Um, um, so th th this is the, the Prometheus uh, dashboard. Um, so we are going to see the, uh, we're just doing this locally from the, um, uh, from the, from the kind uh, cluster. So th these are the same metrics that, that happened during the, the, the demo. Basically, I just recorded it and then I, I had the Prometheus running. Um, so you'll see um, in this case, we had uh, 33 deny um, violations and then 24 um, uh, dry run violations. And uh, you can also have another, uh, you can also define your own sort of like enforcement action. Uh, but then that one is categorized is un unrecognized and then we didn't add any of those. Uh, so that's zero. And then you can graph it. Uh, so you, you, and then over time, uh, you can see like how much it changed uh, and how many uh, dry run uh, changes you had. Uh, so you could have um, um, alerts, uh, you know, alert manager to say like, hey, if there's any dry, uh, in, in anything um, uh, that are denying alert me on Slack or whatever. And then in this case, we are seeing the audit last, uh, last run. So th that's the last time timestamp of the audit one. And then here, how many constraint templates we had. Uh, so in this case, we had uh, four and then we deployed another one and then that's five. Um, and then I believe, and then we are gonna see the number of constraints. Uh, so we have one dry run it, as, you, as you saw last, last uh, part of the demo. Um, and we had four uh, deny uh, constraints. And then you can see the, the values there too. Um, and then these are the requests counts. Uh, as uh, you know, uh, Kubernetes always does uh, re re requests uh, in which are allowed. So the, the, the red one you see are the, the requests that the Kubernetes does to itself. And then these are the ones that V did it and then that got denied. Uh, so those are four, four denies, uh, but Kubernetes keeps doing re requests so you can uh, keep track of those as well. Uh, because we didn't uh, do any, um, uh, no, nothing to de deny those, so that just get, will keep happening. And then going back to the demo. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Sertaj. I'm going to power through the, the rest of the deck here, and, and we have a few questions. So just a status on the project, it's in beta, which we've answered. It's uh, looking to define HA to go to GA for V3 of Gatekeeper. If this is something that interests you, we're interested in understanding how you want to use it, feel free to raise issues. I've heard a lot of questions on different things that we haven't thought of as part of Gatekeeper. Feel free to bring them, uh, to, bring them to the community uh, and we will show you the links in a minute. Keep going. I know there is, uh, were some questions about policy libraries. They're all in the upstream repository. So there are pre, uh, predefined constraint templates and even a pod security policy equivalent where we've modeled uh, effectively what the pod security policy API does in a gatekeeper constraint templates. So you could consider using that. And that was something that was just asked generally in the community. So um, the maintainers went and worked on that. Okay, and keep going. Potential growth here. We've had a question about mutation. Mutation is complex. Uh, so it's a lot of work to make mutation um, work in the way and make it uh, have stable outcomes. So feel free to come and help with that if you're interested. External data sources like different directories, different um, places where you can make decisions on whether you admit or deny a request. Authorization, um, likely a separate project, but Kubernetes allows different webhooks for both admin, admission and authorization. Could it be used for authorization as well? Uh, developing audit features, we had some great questions about that where we could just put audit data and just develop a tooling, making it um, way more simple to use and integrate into. They're all areas we're interested in getting people involved in. And finally, feel free to come and join us. There are meetings every alternating Wednesday.
Um, and there is on the Open Policy Agent Slack, a Kubernetes policy channel. You can come there or you can just go to the uh, Gatekeeper repository and start getting started. Um, and with that, that concludes our um, slide deck. I will try and rush through these final three questions that we have before we close out the time. Um, is there any support to deploy OPA GK via Customize? Um, so uh, today, by, by default, we, we use Customize uh, for the, 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 the default Cube Builder um, like uh, installation. Um, but other than that, we support YAML uh, to deploy and also a Helm chart to deploy. Thank you. Uh, this this question is really interesting. I'll take it. If if an old pod, pod from a deployment violates a new rule, I understand that it will not evict. evict. What will happen if the node where the pod was running is drained? Um, does the old pod get re-recreated on another node or deleted? So this is an important thing to remember and I'm gonna answer this very quickly. This is an admission, so it doesn't change values at runtime. If uh, a node is drained and the pod needs to be recreated by a controller like a deployment controller, if it now violates, that you're gonna see an error on that um, replica set saying I cannot create this anymore and you're going to see the policy violation rule at the replica set level so go check there but it's not going to modify things at runtime only at admit time so if you have pods running that are now in violation you've got to delete them yourself um, can I use Prometheus metrics to track violations for a specific policy or just across all I think I can answer this it's just across all currently and I'm going to try and knock the last one out uh, what yeah, just, framework... just comment. We, we, we didn't want to uh, do for specific things because of like um, uh, privacy uh, co co concerns. Uh, since Prometheus and then the metrics endpoint runs in a in a, in a public um, uh, in, in, publicly, so uh, everybody can see it. Uh, so we didn't want to specify things in there that could be. Uh... Well, I'm cutting you off, Sir Taj. Karen's got ten seconds. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, all right. Well, thank you, Sir Naj and Lucky, for a great presentation. That's all the time we have for today. Thanks for joining us. The webinar recordings and slides will be online later today, and we look forward to seeing everyone at a future CNCF webinar. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.